So the verse I felt to share is, to start with, is we're talking about why Jesus. And there's a powerful verse because because Easter is um, so clearly about what Jesus has done to provide a way for us to know him. So there's a powerful verse in Colossians that talks about what he's doing. I'm going to read it from the message paraphrase because as I was preparing, there was a couple of phrases that just really stood out to me. And uh, I think they're applicable for us tonight. And it says, God rescued us from dead end alleys and dark dungeons. Dead end alleys and dark dungeons. He sets us up in the kingdom of the son he loves so much. The son who got us out of the pit we were in, got rid of the sins we were doomed to keep repeating. So that, those, two, those two phrases, dead end alleys and dark dungeons, I think has some of you really, as soon as I say those words, you're like, yeah, that's me. I feel like I've been going around and around and I'm hitting a dead end every time I try. Or you feel like you're in a dark dungeon, you feel overwhelmed at the moment. Do you know, we can't get ourselves out of dead-end alleys and dark dungeons. We can't actually lift ourselves up out of a pit. If we're in a pit, we actually need someone to come and help us. (laughs) I went with my kids to Latitude a little while ago. Thought, I'm going to be one of those mums who just gets in there and does everything because I'm like right there with my kids. So I thought, I'm going to try everything they try. Mate, I nearly had a... Mid, mid-air panic attack when I'm walking around that. That's really high. You think, oh, yeah, that's fine. No worries. I'm like, this, just look straight ahead. I did it. I did it. <laughs> but um, we went there and we would, my husband and I were sort of, he's really annoying because I knew he was going to beat me. But he, you know those, um, it's like the, oh, I can't, they're like long, big things, stick things that you stand on the you stand on the, the rail and you and you knock someone off into the foam pit. Do you get what I'm saying, right? Gladiator. Gladiator. Thank you. I couldn't think of the word. <laughs> anyway, so knock, knocking you around, all this sort of stuff. So he knocks me off, of course, and I'm I fall into this foam pit and I can't get out. <laughs> I literally, it's, it was hilarious. I was nearly crying, like with laughter. An embarrassment because I could, like, I lost my latitude socks. I had to dig down and, like, try and find them. Um, my kids are, like, going, Mum, what are you doing? Just get out. I'm like, I can't get out because <laughs> I, like, keep sucking you back and, you know. Anyway, so I needed my husband, whose name Michael means Prince Who Protects, to, to grab and pull me out of that pit because I could not get out of it myself. And, you know, it's a funny story. And I hate to think who might have been taking, like, video footage of that because that would have looked really unglamorous. But it's an illustration that when we get some circumstances, some, some things we find ourselves in, we actually can't fix it. We can't get ourselves out of the pit. We can't pull ourselves up by our latitude socks and rock on. Like, we can't do it. And so we actually need... A saviour, and we're going to talk about this saviour Jesus who came. We actually need someone who is stronger, who is bigger, who is able to lift us out and up to be with him where he is. And so a couple of other specific um, pictures or things that I had as I was praying for tonight's service, I just want to share them with you now. Again, assess it. It might be for you. Uh, I had the word snake bite, which is like, what? Um, I think it's a, a, an analogy. Um, as in, when you think of a snake bite, you think of someone who's been bitten by a snake. And in the Bible, the snake is always a symbol of demonic activity. And I just feel that there's someone or multiple people here who have felt a real onslaught coming against you. Because we actually are in a spiritual battle. There's spiritual forces at work to try and stop us and hinder us from living the plan God has for us. And there's been times where this on sort of opposition, you feel like it's going to actually destroy me. It's going to be too strong for me. But that's a lie. 
There has been some demonic activity that's been stirred up against you to stop moving forward in the plans God has for you, but it can't destroy you. Your life is in Jesus' hands because Jesus is the antidote to the venom of those lies, right? (laughs) You need to apply truth, his word, to this little snake bite thing. Jesus is your strong protector and shield. The enemy of our soul does come to kill, steal and destroy, but Jesus has come to give us life in all its fullness. He says, I've given you authority over to tread on snakes and scorpions. There's that word again. (laughs) And to overcome all the power of the enemy, nothing will harm you. He says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. With Jesus on the inside of you, you can actually say to anything that tries to oppose you going forward in God's plan, you know what, I'm going to submit myself to God, I'm going to resist you devil and you have to flee in Jesus' name. If that's you, we would love opportunity to pray with you after, or if that's multiple people, because I believe Jesus wants to lift you out of a pit that you've been feeling and facing. I feel like there's someone here tonight who had a fight with their family member on the way here and all of you are like, that's me. (laughs) But it's quite quite specific, all right? Okay, so just bear with me. I I had the word fighting words, fighting words. And I felt like there's, sometimes there's words that you speak which by their very utterance inflict injury or wound others terribly. It's like a button gets pressed in your life and what comes out, you're like, I want to just pull it back. But it's almost like, it almost feels involuntary. You've tried everything to stop these fighting words coming out of your mouth. Someone in your family presses this button and your words cut like a knife. I'm not saying what they do is right, but I feel like God just wants to encourage you It's time to acknowledge you need help. Only Jesus can lift you out of the pit of hurt and anger and shame that you feel when you speak those words. Jesus doesn't condemn you. He doesn't point the accusing finger. He came to help you. You need the transforming power of Jesus to heal you and help you take responsibility for your words and by his enabling, start to speak life-giving words. And I believe he's going to help you. I believe your words are going to be life-giving words. By the end of this year, I believe you're going to be known in your family as an encourager. The one who cannot be... You're going to be known as the one who people can't provoke into fighting words. Because the, the, the character of Christ is going to flow through you. But I just believe it starts here tonight. Only Jesus can lift you out of this. Will you let him? We're going to have an opportunity to pray. Last one for now. (laughs) Another person I believe here, I feel like God's given me a picture for you. Um, And the picture is of uh, you looking at a brick wall. um, And it's like a dead end, symbolising a dead end. You keep reaching dead ends. Every time you turn to come back to the entry to the alleyway where you went down... Jesus is standing there with his arms outstretched. But you just brush past him because you're sure you're going to find what you're looking for down the next alley that you try. And this has happened multiple times. I believe this has to do with spirituality. You're searching for meaning and you want to be sure, so you're trying lots of different options. And each time you don't find what you're looking for, you come back and you look at Jesus and he's still standing there with his arms outstretched. But you're convinced he doesn't have what you're looking for. You think you have him all figured out. Well, tonight I believe he's saying to you, look again. Take another look. Look at me. Consider who I am and take another step. And then another step toward me. And as you fall into my arms, you'll find what you're looking for. I just believe that's for someone here tonight. gone very quiet (laughs) 
I felt prompted to step out and share that because Jesus is a real person who's really alive. And he doesn't want us to just go through the motions of thinking that we come and we, we go through the motions and we talk about Palm Sunday and then we go home. He actually wants to speak to us and have us encounter him. So Palm Sunday is the Sunday before Easter. It's a time when Jesus' church across the world centers people's minds and hearts on the beginning of the week leading up to Jesus' death and resurrection. As Jesus rode on a donkey into the city of Jerusalem, a large crowd gathered, waved palm branches and spread out their outer robes across the road, giving him royal treatment. The huge crowd shouted with great joy and they welcomed Jesus into the city. So Palm Sunday helps us remember that Jesus is the Saviour King. That's the end of my message. Not really. But sometimes we think about significant events in the life of Jesus like that. We just think, okay, let's just go through the info. Let's just recap it. Let's just look over it and then let's go home. We don't actually stop to consider the significance of what actually took place. We think we know. (laughs) But can I ask you to consider the size of the crowds that were there in Jerusalem when this happened, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Do you know, they took a census and they estimated um, the number of lambs that were killed for roast lamb for the celebration of the Passover feast. And if you you don't know what that means, on our YouTube channel, familycenter.tv, Pastor Bill spoke last week. His message is up there about Passover and what it means and what the celebration symbolised. But they had a Passover feast surrounding towns in Jerusalem, and there were 265,000 lambs killed for roast lamb. That's a lot of lamb. And if you had like 10 people per family or per people community have, per, have a lamb, have a feast on a lamb, <laughs> do you know that means that there could have been at least 2,700,000 people in Jerusalem and the surrounding towns? Like it was packed wasn't just a little quiet rendezvous. It was packed. What about the timing? This is not a coincidence. What happened after Palm Sundays, the week leading up to Jesus' death, and it was no coincidence. God wanted everything to start to work out in exact detail as everything in Jesus' life. But Jesus chose... Passover week. I mean, talk about symbolism. The great national exodus feast of Israel, he chose this time to make his crucial move into Jerusalem, the week before his death. And all four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, talk about his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. So it's significant. We're supposed to think about it. We're supposed to take notice. Consider the reports of many miracles and the testimonies of people who'd been healed or set free by Jesus. I mean, there was probably hundreds or thousands of people who were healed by Jesus. Do you think they just went home and said, oh, yeah, you know, got over it? Like They would have been so excited to talk about what Jesus has done in their life with their family and friends. And then the big whopper of a miracle, Lazarus. Just before this, he gets raised from the dead. Now, he was dead and buried in the grave for four days. That's not a pretty thought. But Jesus raised him from the dead. And so as they're traveling into Jerusalem for this Passover feast, everyone, what would they have been talking about? Do you really think that could happen? Do you really think that someone could raise someone from the dead? Do you really think that... He was really dead. Like, they would have been talking about it. So there's this buzz in the air that's happening as all these people are streaming into Jerusalem. Like dry kindling wood ready to blaze into a raging fire. The the crowd that was there, it didn't take much for this excitement and this mob hysteria to rise up. and And the match that lit the flame was Lazarus. The news about him. In John 12, 11, we read that the Jewish leaders had already decided to kill Lazarus because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed. 
Not only had they decided to kill Jesus, they decided to kill Lazarus. I'd never noticed that before. So I want you to get this picture in your mind. Like Sam said, we're going to get the, let, get the camera lens and zoom in on an individual walking along the dusty road, heading into Jerusalem. Then you zoom back a bit and you've got families. And then you zoom back and you've got all the extended family and hundreds of people. And you zoom back and you've got thousands. You zoom back again, you've got millions. It's a crowd. They're wanting to set their eyes on this dead man who's now walking around. And they wanted to see for themselves the one who did this astounding miracle. They wanted to see Jesus. And just, think, just think about the sound of the cheers. I mean, most of us here have been to a footy or a soccer match. 50,000 people is pretty loud. Even if only a quarter of the city came out, that's a lot of noise. Cheering, that's a deafening noise, cheering for Jesus. <laughs> In Matthew 21, verse 9, it says, the, the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna means save, we pray. Son of David is Jesus is coming from the royal line of King David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when people in the crowd shouted and cheered these words, they were looking at Jesus, this anointed one, this deliverer, this promised one who has who has finally come. So Jesus is hearing the shout of this mob. <laughs> but they expected him to be a different type of king that he refused to be. He wasn't a political king. They expected him to come in Call to arms, everyone grab their weapons, let's overthrow Rome. But he's, that's not the type of king he is. He didn't come to use violence to overthrow a political kingdom. He was not just a miracle worker who would enable the Israelite people to throw off the rule of oppressive Roman occupiers. Jesus was not the king they were expecting. He wasn't. <laughs> And like Sam said, this Easter, there's lots of people who God has placed in our spheres of influence who have preconceived ideas about who Jesus is. God has placed us in their lives to help them take a step towards him. You might have a neighbour, a uni friend, a child, (laughs) a co-worker, someone in your extended family. We have an opportunity to help people encounter Jesus. Let's have a look at this.
Crystal's friends, when she arrived in Australia, <laughs> shared with her there's, there's more. She grew up in a family that, you know, taught her about Jesus and she was a follower of Jesus, but she, she had this amazing encounter with the Holy Spirit where God came up close and personal. She received this brand new spiritual prayer language. She was unaware how much more God wanted to speak to her and move in her life on a daily basis. And there's people in our life who aren't necessarily Christians, who don't have a relationship with Jesus, that we get to say, you know what, there's so much more. (laughs) We have an opportunity. We really do. Like Easter is the best opportunity in the year for us to be the mouthpiece of Jesus, to say, come and see. Come and see. I encourage you and I urge you to ask God to help you to just show an interest in someone and ask them questions about Easter. Have you ever heard, had someone explain who Jesus is and why Jesus is such a big deal for people at Easter time? They might go, nah, not interested. Oh, well. Have you ever gone to church over the Easter weekend? What was it like? Can I tell you about my church, what God's doing at the 5.30 service? Have you got plans this Easter? Would you come with me to my church? It's a really relaxed and welcoming place. And so many people talk about how they can sense the presence of God when they come here. Have you ever asked Jesus to show you if he's real? Do you want to come celebrate Easter at my church? It's going to be really great. Like, that's not weird. That's just being a good friend. (laughs) We can do that. So I encourage you just to pray like Sam said before. Think about who you could invite because they will come with you. Even I didn't come the first time my friend asked me, but I came the second time. And that was nearly 19 years ago that I gave my life to Jesus at our Easter production. People are watching and seeing the symbols of Easter and it's a wonderful opportunity for us to be the mouthpiece of Jesus. And if we're not excited and energised at the thought of getting to know him more, (laughs) how can we encourage others to experience him for themselves? Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. How's your flow How's the flow in your heart? Is it full of gratitude and awe and wonder? Because that's why we come to church. We come to church to get a top up so it's full to overflowing so that when we go out into the week, we say, you know what? I can't help but speak about how great God is. He wasn't the king that they were expecting. (laughs) But Jesus far exceeds our expectations. Sometimes he's not the king we expect. He's far greater. But it's like we box him in. We say, you know what? I've got you all figured out, Jesus. He's so much bigger than we can grasp. There was no hired multitudes to applaud Jesus like the Roman generals had when they would come into the city as a victory parade. They had all these people and stewards and aides and flowers and symbols and wealth on display and 70 oxen behind them to come to sacrifice to their Roman gods. I mean, it was a big extravaganza. The king of kings came riding into Jerusalem on a donkey with just ordinary everyday people who couldn't contain their praise and their worship, throwing their robes in front of him. And when a king was going to come for war, he'd come on a horse. When he was going to come in peace, he came on a donkey. And what Jesus was doing was actually prophesied 500 years before it happened. In Zechariah, it says... Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, 
lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. That's a picture of Jesus that someone spoke 500 years before he actually was there riding into the city. That's amazing. (laughs) He was not the king they were expecting. In Luke 19, 39, it says, Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. How can you let this crowd worship you? How can you let them express adoration and praise to you? That's like blasphemy. And he says, I tell you, If they keep quiet, the stones will cry out because all of creation cries out. All of creation has been waiting for this moment. All of creation and all of human history points up to this time when I am willingly humbling myself, setting my face to go to the cross. And soon the shouts of Hosanna would turn to crucify him. And Jesus knew all this. But he said, all creation, even the rocks, can't hold it out, can't hold it back. This worship of King Jesus, because this is who he really is. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the Lord of life. And so when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and they asked in Matthew 21, who is this? What king humbles himself in this way and chooses a donkey and no fanfare or entourage to accompany his coming? What king inspires spontaneous and rapturous shouts of victory like they were seeing and hearing? Who is this? He is not the king that we expect either. He blows our misconceptions and misgivings away and melts our heart with how far he chose to go to purchase our freedom. And he starts to weep, actually, as he goes into Jerusalem, because he's like, if you had only known the peace you could have, but now it's been hidden from you. He grieves. He starts to cry out and grieve. (laughs) He's a king that's different to any other king in history. He's more wonderful than we can imagine. He's more beautiful than we could ever fathom. And his power was demonstrated in a way that no one imagined. He humbled himself. He humbled himself. He didn't demand. Look at this in Philippians 2 verses 6 to 8. It says, Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather... He made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, why would he do that? Why would he go all the way in proving his love for us? Well, that's just it. He chose to do it. And some of you have, gone, have heard this before and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 hear it tonight. He chose to lift you up out of the pit of your sin and your shame and the things that would cause God to say, no, 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 you cannot be in my presence. He chose to humble himself, to lay his life down, to shed his blood on a cross, to reach down and lift you up out of that spiritual pit (laughs) and to say you're with me now you get to spend forever with me because I'm not dead anymore I'm alive and the punishment that was meant to be on you for your sin actually went on me so that you could be free to live and love and enjoy and serve me as in God the one you were made for Colossians 1, 13 to 14 in a different version says, For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. 
Do you know, Jesus is not the king we expect. He won't always meet your demands. He'll often challenge you to your very core. Who's directing your life? But by his very act of laying down his life, he's worthy of our trust. He's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our lives. Jesus is the king we need. The the king we never knew we needed. (laughs) The king we sometimes forget that we need. He's the king we need. He's different than we expect. But that verse in Philippians, it finishes by saying, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name. The name Jesus means saviour, God saves. He reaches down and draws me up so I can be with him. The name that is above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess or acknowledge that Jesus Christ is what? He is Lord. Is he Lord of your life tonight? Why don't we pray and just spend a bit of time now talking with and listening to King Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Sometimes all we think we've got you figured out. (laughs) And then we take another look and we think, wow. You are far greater than we could ask or imagine. We're sorry for the times when we think we don't need you when we forget Jesus is Lord you're a reigning and a ruling king you've risen from the dead you're seated at the right hand of the father the only reason we can have relationship real relationship with you is because you reached down (laughs) You lowered and humbled yourself. You came and were obedient to death on a cross. You took the punishment for my sin, for the sins of the world. And you offer us real relationship with a holy God. Who is this? This king, this saviour king, we worship you. You might just want to start to thank him out loud. We worship you, Jesus. We don't take you for granted. We worship you, Lord. You didn't have to come. You willingly endured the cross. In your humanity, you didn't even want to go through with it, but you said, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Thank you for going through with it, God. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you, Jesus, for going all the way. (laughs) Right now, this is an opportunity for you. If you've never really understood what Jesus did for you and you want to meet him you want to encounter him you want to have real relationship him for the very first time 
He's speaking to you tonight. He's saying, just receive my help. Receive my love. Receive my forgiveness. Receive me into your life and come follow me. If you're here tonight and that's you, you're saying, yes, I want to do that. Would you put your hand up? Put it up high. I'm going to include you with a prayer. That's good. Put it up high. There's more time. I see that hand. Yep. Anyone else? Thank you, Lord. Right across this place, church, let's pray. If you lifted up your hand or you're saying, this is me, God, I'm praying this prayer. This is my opportunity right now to come into your family. You just pray this prayer in your heart. Dear Jesus, thank you that you love me. Thank you that you died on a cross for my sin. I'm sorry for all the things I've done wrong, Lord, and for trying to live life without you. But now I receive your forgiveness. I receive your love. Holy Spirit, come into my life. Help me to follow Jesus until I meet him face to face. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, (laughs) you are now a Christian. You are a follower of Jesus. You're a child of God. You might not feel different, but there's been a spiritual transaction that has taken place. Your sins have been washed away as far as the east is from the west. God loves you. He forgives you. He's come into your life. And it will never be the same. And we would love to help you.